You're welcome. My name is Emmanuel Odeke, and today we'll be discussing uh, false prophet. So false prophets are on a hot spot today, and uh, that's what we'll be discussing for the entire show. So with me again today is uh, Reverend Rogers from ACFA, the African Center for Apologetics Research. False prophets is what we are looking at today. Now, let, let, let's start from there. Do we still have prophets in Uganda and the entire world in the church setting today? I think we are starting in the middle. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, for you to answer that question, you have to define what you mean by a prophet. Mm -hmm. Because different people can understand the word prophet differently. And usually when people use it, they mean different things. Okay. So it so would let's be start good to start with part. the biblical understanding. Uh -huh. As Christians, when we talk about a prophet, what are we talking about? And biblically speaking, we are thinking about a spokesperson for God. A person who has been appointed by God to communicate his word and his will to God's people. A prophet can be understood especially in two ways. He can be understood as a fourth teller in a sense that he is preaching and proclaiming God's message. So from that understanding, a preacher is actually a prophet because he delivers God's will, communicates God's word in a way that edifies God's people. But a prophet can also be understood as a foreteller, a person who predicts the future, a person who communicates God's word for the time that has not yet come. And usually when we talk about the word prophet, we are not even thinking about a preacher who foretells. We are often thinking about a person who foretells or who communicates a message that will come for the future. When you look at the Old Testament, you will notice that God had raised the prophets that were speaking on his behalf to the nation of Israel. You think of men like Moses, men like Elijah, you think of people like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and these men would be proclaiming God's word, would be warning God's people about judgment if they have fallen into sin. They would be bringing messages that were exhortational to God's people and sometimes correcting their understanding of who God is that they may properly worship well. Now, when you come to the New Testament, again, you will find a number of prophets. Sometimes they are not even mentioned directly, men like John the Baptist, men like the prophet Agabus, and four daughters of Philip are mentioned in the New Testament. And what are they doing? They are receiving revelation and giving it to the people. They are guiding God's people into true biblical worship. Some of these prophets were evangelists, Others were confirming the ministry callings and giftings of God's people. Now, once we set the stage to understand who a prophet was, both in the Old and in the New Testament, now we can begin to answer questions like, do we have prophets today? And if I can answer that very quickly and simply, I would say yes and no. I would say yes in a sense of a prophet being a person who foretells or proclaims the word of God, in that sense we can say every preacher today is a prophet. He communicates God's word and God's will to God's people. But on the other hand, we can say that we don't have prophets today, especially if we use the definition of foretelling, where we have people who were occupying prophetic offices like we see in the Old Testament, men like Isaiah, like Ezekiel, like Daniel, people who not only proclaimed and predicted God's word, but also recorded it down in what we have today as the prophetic books of the Old Testament. In that sense, we no longer have those kinds of prophets who write God's word down and we call it the scriptures. Men who predict future events and they come to pass to the dot as we see in the Old Testament. But again, there is also another angle why one would say that we don't have prophets as we find them in the scriptures today. Why? You go back to what was the purpose of a prophet. A prophet's purpose was to proclaim God's will. But now we have God's will in the scriptures written down for us 
not just for a historical period or event, but for all times. Whatever we want to know concerning God's will for our lives in matters pertaining to faith and practice is already in the word of God. So today if you say you are a prophet, what kind of prophet are you? Are you bringing new revelation that God had not revealed before? Because whatever God wanted us to know, he has already revealed it in the scriptures. Which means, if you bring a new information that is not in the Bible, simply put, you are a false prophet. Because God did not forget anything, our God is not a forgetting God, he does not have amnesia. That one day he will say, oh my goodness, I wanted to say this, I forgot it, now let me communicate it through prophet so and so. But if you proclaim a message that is already in the scriptures, then you are not predicting anything because we already have it in the scriptures. What you are doing is that you are explaining, you are proclaiming what is already found in the scriptures. So in that case, if you prophesy faithfully, you are a preacher. If you prophesy what is, in the is not in the Bible, you are a false prophet. If it's already in the Bible, then you are not a prophet because we already know it, we already have it. What you are doing, you are expounding it, you are proclaiming it, you are preaching it. So, do we have prophets today? In the sense of the Old Testament? No. Do we have prophets in the sense of preachers today? Yes, we do. Do we have prophets who bring new information? No. If they bring new information, it's not coming from God because God has finally and fully spoken in Jesus as we read in Hebrews chapter 1. If someone proclaims what is already in the Bible, they are preachers because they are not bringing new revelation. They are explaining already revealed revelation. Now, uh, the way... Uh I have often heard nowadays young people say, man of God prophesy. Mm. And, mm. and, and uh, there are people I have, I have heard uh, telling people of their history, mm. even when mm. they were not part mm. of their history, they were not there with them. Mm. And they are able to retrieve that information. Mm. What mm. are those called? And they are able to, to, to maybe uh, say in the next one year you're going to be here or something of this kind or something of this kind is going to happen. Mm. What, what are those? If you meet those people and they truly say certain things and they come to pass, those are very few people and it is a rare occurrence. It's not an office that this person is exercising every day. You could be in a worship service and God releases a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. He gives you an understanding of what somebody is going through for purposes of prayer and encouragement. Now, that does not make you a prophet. It just means you have offered a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom in a particular situation. When we think about the biblical understanding of a prophet, we are talking about a person who is a prophet as a full-time calling and occupies that office. And from that understanding, we do not have them today. Most of the prophets we have today, and who unfortunately are not true biblical prophets, are those you will hear today who are predicting football matches, is it Man U which will win or Arsenal? There are those who are predicting that if your wife is pregnant, she will give birth, either it will be a boy or a girl, uh -huh. and of course we all know it will always be either. Mm. Either it's a boy or it's or a girl, it can't be both. Mm. So we don't really need that prophecy even to, to know. That is really obvious. So does that, that one still of the qualify two is to going be a prophecy? Happen. Not in the biblical understanding. And that's why I have a concern personally. That we have an influx, in fact an explosion of self-proclaimed prophets in Africa today who claim to be speaking for God in the same way as biblical prophets did it, command and demand authority from their members, and in most cases expect them, the, the followers, to submit to them fully without even ever thinking about it, and yet in more, so many ways they have been revealed not to be true biblical prophets as we know them. And so the question comes, what happens when you follow somebody whom you thought was a prophet and was bringing God's will for your life to you and then one day you wake up and realize it was all a lie 
or maybe he had even done some research on you from Facebook or social media and he came and told you details about your life, you thought that God had actually spoken. And then one day you realize that was not God who did. How harmful do you think that is? And sadly, that is the plight that the church in Uganda finds itself today. That we have so many hurting Christians who have been abused and misused by people who claimed to be prophets, God's spokesmen, but actually God never sent them. And followers, believers who followed them innocently or ignorantly have ended up being disappointed or heartbroken when those prophecies did not come to pass in their lives. And when that happens, not only does it hurt the church or believers who follow them, but it also damages the witness of the Christian faith. Non-believers who see the so-called prophets prophesying things that never come to pass, what are they supposed to think of the Christian faith? That we are in Katemba, that this is a sham. Like I remember some time back in one of the elections, there is one man who prophesied and said one of the presidential candidates was going to die before the election day. And to our knowledge, we know that none of the candidates died, at least not within the election period. So if someone who is not a Christian is watching something like that, hearing a man who claims that God spoke, but what he said does not come to pass, what will that non-believer think about the Christian faith? It's not worth belonging to. And that is why every Christian needs to be concerned. That when we have people claiming to be messengers of God and are not, not only do they harm those who are within the Christian faith, but they undermine the gospel witness, which is really, really sad. Mm. On social media, uh, uh, recently I did uh, see uh, a post of a prophet who was caning his followers for failure to bring their tithe. Real cane. You, you get a, a cane and he flogged <laughs> literally the entire church. Mm, mm. With that kind of look at things, what are some of the acts of these false prophets? I am afraid there is a lot of harm and damage they are doing to the church. You watch the one who is caning people, but he's just one of the so many out there. Some have been asked to eat grass in the name of they will receive deliverance. Some time back we had some from Southern Africa who were drinking petrol and they were convinced that by faith it will turn into pineapple juice. We had one of the prophets who was stepping on the backs and stomachs of pregnant women in the name that they will be able to deliver safely. So there is a lot of katemba that is going on in the name of Christ and in the name of the faith that should really not be tolerated by the church. And because of the danger that false prophets pose to the church today, that is why you and I need to be very careful and to be sure that we understand who a true messenger of God is. And that is why the Bible calls us to test prophets. From the Old Testament all the way to the book of Revelation, you have a call by God on how a prophet should be seen, who a prophet is, what he is expected to do, and what we as believers need to be looking out for when we hear somebody who is claiming to be a prophet. In fact, I was uh, reading through uh, the, the book of uh, Jeremiah, and I was looking at these serious warnings that God gives in Jeremiah chapter 23. And I'm wondering, why is it that as a church today we are not keen to examine and test the prophets? And yet scripture is full of warnings and calls like this. L listen to what the prophet Jeremiah says here. In chapter 23, from verses 16 he says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. You come to verse 21, he says, I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. Come to verses 25 and 26. He says, I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. Lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. 
verses 26. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their minds? Mark that. Not the word of God, not what God has told them, but the delusions of their mind. You come to verses 31 and 32, Jeremiah is still at it. He says, Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues, and yet declare that the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies, yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. When someone claims the Lord has sent them, or has given them a dream, or a revelation, or a vision and a prophecy, and the Lord actually did not tell them this, not only do you become a victim of their lies, but scripture says that these visions and dreams do not even benefit you anything because the Lord never said them. You see, God is faithful and is committed to his word. When God makes a promise, he will see to it that it comes to pass no matter what. So what happens when God has not given you a promise and for you, you believe that he has given it to you? Does it come to pass because you believe it sincerely? And the answer is no. That God is only obligated to his word and if God has not said anything, it doesn't matter who said it and what they claim to be. That promise will not come to pass. And of course when it fails, what is the logical conclusion? Christianity has failed, it doesn't work. Maybe God is not strong enough to fulfill what he promised me. And as a matter of fact, we have seen a number of Christians who have walked away from the Christian faith thinking that God let them down or lied to them, simply because the prophets told them certain things that did not come to pass. And because they concluded that God has failed them, eventually they have walked away from the Christian faith altogether. False prophecy is not just a deception, but it is destructive. It is destructive emotionally and psychologically. It is destructive spiritually. And for so many people who continue to buy into the prophet's lies, it is even destructive eternally. If Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, the reverse is equally true. That if you buy into a lie, the lie will keep you in the bondage. And that is why it is very crucial for believers to learn how to test the prophets. And that is why I'm here tonight. To share with you ways in which you can test prophets. How do I know a man who has really been sent by God? And how do I know one who claims to be sent of God but actually is not? The Bible gives us not only several passages on how we can identify prophets, but it gives us a criteria by which we can test them to be able to know whether these people are really messengers of God or they actually are not. I could give a couple of tests, for instance. One of those tests is that if someone claims to be a true prophet of God, he must fulfill what we call the faithfulness test. What do I mean by that? That his prophecy or his message must be faithful to the scripture that has already been revealed or the revelation that God has already revealed in the scripture. And why do I say that? Because God is a God who does not change. If God has already said something in the Bible, he's not going to change his mind one of these days and say, oh, I know I had said uh, that uh, you, you should uh, never divorce your wife, but now depending on circumstances, I think you may. That would not be the God of the Bible. So when a prophet speaks, when we measure his message, is it consistent with what God has already revealed or is it contradicting or adding to the word of God as already found in scriptures? Or maybe even distorting what is already there? As early as the book of Deuteronomy, Moses gives the test of who a false prophet is. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, Moses says, 
that if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Moses is saying that a prophet can arise or a, some, a dreamer of dreams and he can prophesy certain things. They may even come to pass. He may perform signs and wonders. But if he said, come, let us go and serve other gods, he says, you should not believe that man. Why should you not believe him? Because he is not being faithful to the already revealed word of God. First John chapter 4 and verse number 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Mm. Because many false prophets have gone out mm. into the world. Exactly. Now you need to be careful and put your pastor, your prophet, the one you call prophet, put a big microscope on him or her just to prove if they are really a genuine mm. prophet. Mm. Mm. I'll read again First John chapter 4 and verse number 1 for you before I get back uh, Reverend Rogers. It says, uh, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Mm -hmm. Now, out into the world does not mean USA, does not mean uh, Rwanda. They are there in Uganda, and you must be very careful uh, to, 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 to notice this kind of, of, of people in our midst. And they have churches, uh, pastoring <coughs> people, not small crowds, big crowds for that matter. Reverend Rogers, how do we test mm, mm. Uh, the, the spirits and how do we check these uh, prophets mm. to make sure they are real uh, mm. prophets, mm. true prophets? I am very glad that you have raised First John chapter 4 because in First John chapter 4 verses 1 to 6, the Apostle John actually gives us ways in which you can test the spirit of error which is behind a false prophet. You notice he begins by saying that do not believe every spirit, but test them to see whether they are from God. Why? Because many false prophets have gone into the world. In verse 2 he says that here is how you can recognize the spirit of God. That every spirit of God will confess that Jesus Christ has come in human flesh. So he begins to give, to, 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 to give a doctrinal standard. He says that if you want to know that a prophet passes the faithfulness test, you need to look at Christian doctrine. What does he prophesy? Is it in conformity with the doctrinal teaching that we find in scripture? For instance, what does he say about Jesus? Does he deny the divinity or the humanity of Jesus? And he says, if such a person denies what the Bible teaches about Jesus, such a spirit is a spirit of error, one of the Antichrist. One of the characteristics of today's false prophets is that they always claim new doctrines and new information that is either not in the scriptures or that they claim was hidden but has now been made manifest or revealed to them. And what John basically is saying is that beware of new doctrines or teachings that are not in scripture or that are claimed to have been hidden and now revealed to specific people. That how you know the faithfulness of a prophet is whether he is in conformity with what the Bible has already taught. But number two, when you look at verse six, John says that we are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. Now, remember John is an apostle. And the things he is saying and the things he is writing are inspired words from God and basically become the doctrines of the Christian faith. So what John is basically saying is that anyone who is from God will listen to what the apostles are saying, will believe or submit to what the apostles have written, which is the scripture that we find in the New Testament, 
And he says that anyone who does not listen to us, therefore is not one of us. And he concludes by saying, this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So, if you take a moment and think about your prophet, is your prophet submitted to the teaching of the Bible, especially in, as we see it in the New Testament? Or is your prophet claiming that he is greater than the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John and all the other New Testament teachers and writers? Claiming that for him he's receiving fresh revelation from heaven that no one has ever received before. Claiming that for him he goes to heaven and has breakfast with Jesus and therefore is more special than the New Testament writers, apostles. Because John is saying that anyone who is to be called a faithful and true prophet will listen to what the apostles have already said. Which means if such a man is introducing new teachings that are not in the apostolic teaching and doctrine, such a man is a false prophet. And that's the test of faithfulness that we are talking about. But that's not all. There is also another test that we could talk about. And that is what I call the fruit test. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is talking about false prophets. And in verse 15, he says that watch out for false prophets. For they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward they are ravenous wolves. And then from verses 16, he begins to describe how you know who is really a true prophet. He talks about a good tree bearing good fruit and a bad tree bearing bad fruit. And then he says that you shall know them by their fruit. What is he talking about? Is that if someone claims to be a prophet, then you need to see the fruit that comes out of his prophetic ministry. For instance, his message and teaching, what impact does it have on the people who listen to him or even those who follow him? When you look at his lifestyle, is it in conformity with what he teaches or does he live by a different standard? Is he morally a model of a true godly Christian living? And sadly, when I say something like that, you begin to look around and you see that some of the prophets today who claim to be special messengers of God are not living morally upright lives. Either you are listening to stories of young women who have been used and abused by these prophets in the name of faith, in the name of God said, in the name of I got a dream or a revelation, or you will find that they are lacking in integrity Maybe some of them are even surviving on the sacrificial donations of their followers who have not given out of willingness but have been blackmailed or pressured into giving. Maybe have been promised that when you give within three days you will get ten times more. And we have stories of so many people who have been duped and have been defrauded of their money, of their land titles, of their cars, all in the name of prophecy. I know one family that has recently broken down because the wife who is following a certain popular prophet in Kampala believed that the prophet, that God was going to bless her family if she sells her husband's property and brings the money to the prophet. She began by selling the cows, she started selling household property. Recently she emptied the bank accounts with the husband unaware and as I speak she is currently living with the prophet. Why? Because she believes that this man is speaking from God and therefore God's will for her is that she should be married to the prophet and not the husband she has lived with for 11 years and had four children with. My friends, those are some of the things that happen when we do not heed warnings about false prophets. And so the scriptures are saying that we must test them. We must look at the fruit of their ministry, at the fruit of their lives. Is this prophet's teaching leading you into more godliness? Or is it actually giving you a license into immoral, idolatrous living? Is this prophet, when you listen to him, does he take you deeper into an understanding of what it means to be a Christian? Or is he just telling you things that tickle your ears but don't necessarily build you? 
So by looking at the impact of the prophet's teaching, by looking at the moral character and lifestyle of this prophet, you can tell whether God has sent this man or woman or not. But another test is one that we call the fulfillment test. That by definition, when a prophet predicts something, that something must come to pass. And if it fails to pass, then the, the answer is simple. That that man has not been sent of God. And we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 18, where Moses again tells us about who a true prophet is. And in chapter 18, uh, listen to what Moses says. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 from verses 20 to, to 22. He says, But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything that I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to death. You may say to yourselves, How can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? Verses 22 gives the answer. If, a, if what the prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. Other versions say, do not even fear him or be alarmed by his prophecies. That a true prophet of God, when he speaks something in the name of the Lord, it must come to pass. Now, if you think for a moment, how many prophets do you know who have prophesied things and have come to pass exactly as they spoke them? Because for every one of them you may know, I can tell you over 10 prophets who over a period of time have prophesied different things that have not come to pass. Some either have come and spoken them after the events have already happened, or others have reinterpreted them and claimed they meant something else and it is the followers who have not understood it. But the fulfillment test is very simple. If you say God has sent you and you are a prophet, whatever you prophesy in the Lord's name, it must come to pass. If it doesn't come to pass, the conclusion is simple. The Lord has not sent you. And for such a prophet, the scriptures say, do not be alarmed by such a man. But there is also test number four that I would like to conclude with. And that is what I call the fact test. That when you listen to a prophet, you want to look at the facts of what he says or what he claims. And how true and verifiable are they? You see, friends, Christianity is a reasonable faith that is built on facts. In 1 Corinthians 15, in fact, the Apostle Paul says that Christianity, that, that, that Christianity is founded on the fact of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Paul says that if Christ is not risen from the dead, then we who proclaim the resurrection from the dead are liars and therefore should not be believed. Paul says that Christianity itself is established on the fact of the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. You come to the Gospel of Luke at the beginning of the Gospel. Luke tells us that he has organized an account that he received from careful investigation and research, having listened from the eyewitnesses who were witnesses of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. What Luke is saying is, I'm not telling you what I dreamt. I'm not telling you what I felt. I am telling you what I know to be factually true and can be verified. You can go back and ask questions, whether in history and in archaeology, and you will find that what Dr. Luke describes in his gospel actually did happen. So, why is this very important? It is important because a lot of the prophetic ministry we have today is not established on facts. It is established in myth and fables in dreams and visions, which in most cases are personal and private, and therefore people have no way of verifying because they were actually not there. 
If somebody today stands up and says, I am the Elijah who was promised to come at the end of the times before Jesus returns, that is the claim he is making. How do we know that? Can we go through the scriptures and actually find that what this person is claiming is proven by scripture that it is indeed true? And if it is not true, then such a prophet has failed the fact test. And according to scripture, such a man should be shunned. When I listen to a prophet who claims that God has revealed to him that there are things that are not written in the Bible, and therefore he has written another book that is supposed to explain the truth that are found in the scriptures, what should I think about that man? Especially if we know that God has already given us the scriptures and he has given us everything we need for salvation and for life. In fact, when you read Hebrews 1, it says that in the past, at the various times and in various ways, God spoke through visions and dreams. But now he has spoken to us by his son, that as Christians, the climax of God's prophetic revelation is Jesus coming into the world. In other words, once you have arrived at Jesus, you have reached the climax. Anyone else who comes claiming that God has spoken to him, in such a sense is claiming to be greater than Jesus. And that would not be a fact. And that would not be verifiable. In fact, that would be an outright lie. So when you listen to your prophet and the things he is saying, are they facts that can be verified? Or are they feelings? Are they visions? Are they impressions? Are they emotions that he is feeling? And how do we verify those to know that God has actually spoken? And basically what we are saying is that a prophet of God who is true must pass all those four tests. Now, there are prophets who may pass one test, maybe they may be morally upright and therefore they can pass the moral test, but do they pass the faithfulness test? The message they are giving, is it consistent with what we already find in the scriptures? Do they pass the fulfillment test? Have all the prophecies they have given come to pass in exactly the same way that they claimed to have received them from God? Do they pass the fact test or have they produced new scriptures in addition to what the Bible has already revealed or new revelations that they claim have supplanted the teachings that we already have in the Bible? If a man fails one of the four tests or more, such a man, according to the Bible, is a false prophet and he should be shunned. And that is why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 21 and 22, that do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every appearance of evil. What Paul is saying here is that whenever people speak, and especially speak with authority, are claiming that this is what the Lord has said. That we are to receive those prophecies and then put them to the test. Do they pass the criteria of biblical prophecy? And if we find that they do not pass the test, then the Apostle Paul says we need to shun them. I am always impressed by these Berean believers whom we find in Acts chapter 17 verse 11. These were Berean Jews they had the Apostle Paul preach, and we are told that they received the word of God with eagerness. They were open-minded. They received what they had as being preached by the man of God, and then they put it to the test. We are told that they diligently, they daily searched the scriptures to see if these things were indeed true. When Paul spoke, they didn't believe him because he was an apostle, or he was a great preacher, or he was performing miracles and wonders. No, they said, Paul, we hear you, but now let's open up the scriptures. To when we look at what God has already said, and we hear what you are saying, does your message pass the faithfulness test? And after comparing with the scriptures, then they either believed Paul because his message was consistent, or if it wasn't, they would shun it. And that is what I think that today's Christians, we need to be. People who search the scriptures daily and diligently. 
people who weigh every message that we hear from anybody who claims to be a prophet and we only believe their message in as far as it is consistent with the word of God and remember how we began we said that if a prophet is saying things that the Bible has already addressed we cannot call that prophecy because it is already in the Bible as the already revealed word of God what we call such a man is a preacher he is explaining and interpreting what is already there and known so if he says what the Bible has already said he's a preacher and if he says what is not in the Bible then he's a false prophet because God does not contradict himself God does not give you the Bible and then later he says oh, 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 oh I Forgot need to give something. you something else that I didn't put in as though he had forgotten now at that point just to help somebody out there what would some of the so-called prophecies today look like oh my just we have the, quite a, a number of them and like we said in most cases these prophecies are general and in most cases they are vague like for instance there is one famous prophet in Kampala who has a slogan I'm sure most of you know this uh, you will always hear him saying tomorrow at around this time you will be in a better place now you are left wondering okay what do you mean I will be at a better place are you saying I will be having more money than I had yesterday if I am having headache now do you mean the headache will have gone tomorrow if I am not married are you saying I will have found a spouse tomorrow so the prophecy is too general and vague that even if it happened you wouldn't know how to measure whether it has happened or not I once heard a famous prophet in Kampala again call out some girl from the crowd and he says thus says the Lord the Lord has promoted you from today and then he called the girl forward and asked her what do you do and this girl said I am a housemaid and now I was there wondering and I'm thinking okay if this girl is a housemaid and the Lord has promoted her what has he promoted her to has he promoted her to a wife because there is no higher position in the home beyond being a housemaid so you are left wondering is this God really who is speaking on another occasion I had a certain prophet he invited a certain girl and told her the Lord has told me that your mother died isn't that true the girl said yes and then he said the Lord has even told me and I know where your mother is buried and the girl started crying so I'm here and I'm listening and I'm thinking why would God want to remind the girl that her mother died doesn't she know that her mother died does that require a prophecy because if the mother died she's already aware not only does she know her mother died she knows where her mother was buried so what was the purpose of this prophecy exactly is this meant to serve as an encouragement to this girl why would God want to remind her of the death of her mother how is that supposed to build her life because one characteristic of biblical prophecy is that it is meant to encourage it is meant to edify it is meant to guide it is meant to make you better than you were before so if all it does is to open up old wounds about your past losses how is that God really speaking you can clearly tell that mm, there is a problem here even though the message comes as that says the Lord even it does not pass the common sense test when you think about it I once had another prophet who was prophesying and he said the Lord has told me he's releasing five drums of the Holy Spirit and anyone of you who wants to drink from the Holy Spirit should quickly come here and start drinking and people run forward and started claiming I receive I receive now I'm here again and I'm thinking why would the Holy Spirit be in a drum the Holy Spirit is God the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity so if someone thinks the Holy Spirit can be contained in a drum not only is this an biblical and an scripture but it's actually blasphemous because for you to speak of the Holy Spirit as though he were water in the drum is to reveal your misunderstanding of what the Bible says about the person of the Holy Spirit and again another clear evidence that this cannot be prophecy that is originating from God most of the prophecies we are hearing are not only unbiblical but they are too general 
they are vague and in most cases you don't see how they contribute to the growth and development of somebody's spiritual life if you say man you is going to win over arsenal even if it can turns out true how does that help the body of christ to grow all it does is to prove that this man knows things before they happen and therefore puff him up as the special messenger of God whom everybody should bow their knee to. But in terms of building the church or making God's people more holier than they were before, it has no contribution whatsoever. Does someone have to be a Christian to foretell things that are about to happen? Not really necessarily. Again, in the Bible, we also have some sorcerers and witch doctors and fortune tellers who are able to see things before they come to pass. So because somebody says something and it comes to pass, does not necessarily mean that God is the one who spoke and therefore this man must be a man of God. And you see, that is why in the Bible, among the tests of uh, what a good or true prophecy is, is not the fact of fulfillment alone. There are several other tests that you must consider. You saw in Deuteronomy chapter 13, where it says that a man might even perform signs and wonders. So he could even do miracles. Yet, if he tells you that come let us serve another God, you should know that that man is not a true prophet and therefore you should shun him. Moses is saying that even if he had supernatural power to perform miracles, or even if he could tell events that have not yet come to pass, that necessarily doesn't mean that the power behind him is the power of God. And that's why we don't just look at the fulfillment test, we also look at the faithfulness. What does he teach? Is this biblical doctrine? We look at the fact test. Are the things that he is claiming in conformity with the standard of truth and how we measure it, are they verifiable? That's why we look at the fruit test. When we look at the evidence or the outcome of this man's ministry, is it building the church? Is it moving them towards godliness? Or is it creating a licentiousness kind? Or a promoting some kind of uh, uh, immoral living? So by looking at those several other tests, you can easily tell that this man is a, full, a true prophet of God or he is not. If you only consider the fulfillment, how do we know whether this is the power of God at work or not? Our time is almost done here. Maybe you would, uh, you'd love to do your parting shot and mm -hmm. then probably we should be able to wind up today's show. Brothers and sisters, I know that when we discuss something like this, sometimes it comes out as sounding very negative and critical. And if you are one who is very passionate about your prophet, you may even think that we are trying to criticize or cut your prophet down. But I want you to know that we bring these teachings in the spirit of grace, out of concern and compassion, that you may be sure that you are following the right prophet, because if he is not sent of God, he could harm you physically and spiritually and maybe cause you to forfeit eternal life. What I would ask you to consider is that open the scriptures and carefully be sure that the man you follow, the prophet you believe, is actually the man of God. Instead of going on the defensive and you look at it as though this is Rogers against my pastor or my prophet, maybe you want to open the scriptures to see if what I am actually saying is true. And if you find that indeed the Bible, the prophet does not pass the tests as we find them in scripture, then indeed you should stay away from that man. And if he is being faithful and passes the test, then why not? Follow him and let him lead you into godliness. But before you jump to conclusion, are you sure that the prophet you follow today is God's man for the season? Because if you do not know the truth, you will find yourself in bondage. But if you know the truth and live by it as the scriptures tell us, the truth shall set you free. And it is that freedom and liberty that Christ purchased for you on Calvary's cross that we wish for you, that we pray for you, and it is in that spirit that we warn you about the danger of false prophets that characterize our day.